Good morning to all people who didn't have comrades disrupt your, your drive here. It is good to be with you. I, uh, I, I just want you to know that next week we're starting a series. You know, we did part one of Hebrews. If you were here through early in the year, we're doing part two of Hebrews. So you can get stuck into that. And then uh, that's about five weeks. And then we go into a series on relationships called Love Handles. We, uh, we, will, we will help you. Uh, Stay married. Anyway, and, and if you're single, we'll, we'll just help you. Lord, help me as I lead us in hope. Amen. I made the, the rookie error of uh, reading Dorator's book on ESCOM. Um, and so, you know what's amazing? You, you read a book like that, and uh, as you're reading, you go through these various emotions. So you start off frustrated by about the third page. Uh, uh, but by, by halfway through, you're, you're really frustrated, and then you start to get angry, and then you start to get disillusioned, and then you get depressed. And so I did that to myself. I, I take full credibility. It was all on me. By the end of reading that book, I was, I was <laughs> hopeless. Like, it was just, I mean, he couldn't have articulated any more clearly corruption, bad philosophy, and ineptitude like all mixed up in one beautiful picture. And I just, I read that and I was just like, oh, why? How do I get up? Anyway, so that happened all on me. And then this week, I had a little bit of a long week and I woke up on Friday and, you know, you just feel tired. It was just like, eh. And uh, I went for a surf. Friday's my Saturday. And then... Um, a mate of mine had said to me, listen, my dad's just died. Will you do a funeral? And I went from the surf feeling rejuvenated, and I went and did the funeral. Now, funerals, if you don't know, if, as a pastor, they're hectic. And uh, I finished the funeral, and I was just sad. But, like, I, I am, I'm not a person who gets sad. I was sad the whole of Friday. My wife says to me, what's wrong with you? And I said, babe, I don't know. I'm just sad. I was just depressed. It was just there. Now, fortunately, I'm, I'm not fully human, so by Saturday, I was happy again. But it was just, I felt the feeling that so many people feel day after day and just, ah, uh, sad. And this psalm that we've been studying for the last four weeks speaks to sad. It speaks to hopelessness. It speaks to people who have felt like you found ESCOM. And you're like Trevor Noah, and you've gone through all five stages of, of grief as you've been waiting on the phone. It's just like you've finally got to the space, you've gone through disillusionment, you've gone through anger, you're at depression. Like you've survived the long phone call. You've, you just feel, ah, this psalm speaks to our souls. So I want to dive into the psalm, and it, it goes like this. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why? so disturbed within me. You know, if you are someone who is given to melancholy and depression, the good news for you is that you sit with some of the spiritual heavyweights of the Bible. Moses, he, Moses Jonah, and Isaiah did pretty cool stuff. And each of them, somewhere down the line, went, God, can you just take me because it sucks here. The, the sucks here is my version. But this is what was going on inside him. And de, well, the writer of the psalm goes, I'm so downcast. Now, the, the word downcast doesn't really mean anything in English. But in Hebrew, it means to be dissolved, to be crumpled, to collapse. It's basically a metaphor for complete despair, absolute giving up. I have nothing left. I don't even want to be here. I'm completely out. I'm spent. I'm crumpled. I'm dissolved. I've got nothing left. A bit like the sharks you say. It was just, it's going badly for me. Psalm 42 and 43 are probably some of the most beautiful and practical ways to deal with a downcast soul. And so he goes from, I'm so downcast, to put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It's just like quite jarring. He's talking about how sad he is, and then he goes, put your hope in God. It's a bit like some comrades runners are going to be doing right now. They're going to hit poly shorts, and they're going to be going, 
soul, put your hope in God because we trained for this. Like there's, there's that thing. There is a time in your life where you literally, because you were born again into a living hope, there is a time in your life and there are potentially many times in your life where you literally have to say to yourself, pull yourself towards yourself. Soul, sort yourself out. Let's Put our hope back in God. Stop driving my life. And then your emotions, like those comrades around, is going to say back to you, but I am sore right now. And you're going to have to say to him, but we're going to keep running. And then they're going to go, but this sucks. And you're going to go, but I'm not a victim. And then they go, who the hell are you calling a victim? And then you're going to say, you, my emotions. And you're going to have a conversation with your soul. You're going to do this probably again and again and again, where you are telling your soul how to behave. Because in the droughts that we face in life, you know, drought is when the things that used to feed you stop feeding you. In the droughts that we face in life, you have to take hold of your soul and often tell it what to do. Because if it controls you, man, you're horrible to be around. And you won't live in the living hope. Now, no, this is the horrible, like I'm shouting at you for being depressed. I'm, I'm not. I'm going to tell you how to get out of it. One of the things that we have to learn to do is cultivate hope. Because hope is literally a matter of life or death. There's a guy by the name of Viktor Frankl, and um, he was a Jewish doctor, survived uh, the prison war, Nazi camps. And whilst he was in the Nazi camps, he gave himself to writing a book on the meaning of life. But he tells a story about... Um, another Jewish man who had a dream that on th the 30th of March, and it was, I think it was like 42, that the war would end and they'd be set free. And this man's hopes came alive. And then what happened is he started to get closer and closer and closer to the 30th of March. And two weeks before the 30th of March, he started to get sick. And he got so sick that the day before the 30th of March, he was basically in intensive care. And on the 30th of March, he died. You see, what had happened is that he'd given up hope. And when you give up hope, your body stops fighting. And so his immune system had just gone, I give up. And he'd died because of lack of hope. You cannot survive if you don't have hope. First thing is it's a matter of life or death. The second thing about hope because we really do, we underestimate the power of this thing, is that it will determine the quality of your life. Your level of hope will determine the quality of your life. Let me, I'm going to make a story up to, to try and illustrate this. Imagine two guys get a job in a factory. They work 80 hours a day, a week maybe, 80 a day would be quite a lot. They work 80 hours a week. They are, <clears throat> there is no lunch break. They don't get leave. It is literally slave labor. The job is meaningless. It's just mind-numbing. They, they go through it in a culture that sucks, doesn't notice anyone, no one gets thanked. Now imagine one of them gets told, if you do this really, really well, at the end of this year, you will get the entire company. The other one, gets told, you're going to be paid, they're both going to get paid the same amount, you're going to get paid minimum wage for the rest of the year. You could imagine that the first guy who's going to inherit the company comes to work early, smashes it, he's a good team player, he works excellently, he whistles whilst he works, he goes through his days happy because he's focused on his hope. And you could imagine that the other guy is horrible to be around that he literally has a fight in his brain as to whether he's going to resign today or tomorrow. His entire demeanor and everything else says, go away, I don't want to be around you, I am depressed, this sucks. You can imagine that. Because the quality of your life is determined by your hope. So if you want to live a sucky life, don't build up your hope. The problem is, so many of us have had hope deferred, which is why we have to learn to 
pour out our soul because we've got to cultivate the hope back again so that we can cultivate a quality of life again. I do feel like I'm using a hammer on you. I don't mean to use the hammer of the Word of God. I'm trying to use the Word of God delicately, but I'm not being that delicate. So the writer writes this. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Put your hope in God. Now, in order for me to teach you how to cultivate hope, I have to just quickly explain hope a little bit. Because we all put hope into very different things. I, um, I, I have non-Christian mates who love to debate with me. And so I was chatting to one of them, and they were telling me how their hope, literally, they didn't use these words, but their hope is in the evolution of the human species, that we, we're evolving, we're getting better. It might not be that great now, but we, we're getting better. And, and, they, and I said, well, help me explain that, because it's not looking like we're getting better. And, and the guy said to me, he said, well, if you go back to even 10,000 BC, when we started to get steel tools, we started to change, and, and we had massive jumps in, in culture and massive understanding of how to do life. And, and then you see throughout the ages, we start to grapple with things, and, and with technology, we, we're taking another jump, and you're going to start to see that people are going to clean up their own planet, and you're going to see that people are going to start sorting out the world, and, and we're going to move into basically a bit of a human utopia. To which I said, and you think I'm delusional, because we're mates. So, so I said, I, I believe in Jesus giving me hope in this life to make an impact and add meaning, but my greatest hope is that he's going to come back and he's going to restore stuff. You think AI is going to help us restore stuff. So help me understand uh, this was my question. Help me understand. There are 49.6 million people in slavery right now. That's not even the economic slavery that people are in. There's the gap between the rich and the poor is getting worse. The, the amount of murder, rape, all of that, it, it's percentage-wise hasn't changed. So there, you think we're evolving? I think you're delusional. What you hope in? Matters. You see, I find lots of Christians hope in, we hope in things like God fixing the economy, God turning our country around, which, now I don't want to be mean, but is really just a hope in the economy. It is not a hope in God. You see, because, I mean, Dial this down. I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray for our country to change or our economy to take off. I am talking about where you put your hope. You see, if you are just focused on God fixing stuff, then you're actually focused on his hand and not his person. You're focusing on what he can do for you and that thing supplying your needs, not him himself supplying your needs. And you will miss how he works. So let me give you a few examples of how he works. One day, he fed a dude with Uber Eats with ravens in in a little pool where the ravens would drop like top-notch Afro steak every single day. If your prayer life and your whole hope is in God fixing the economy, you'll miss that. He once allowed three guys to get thrown into a fire, and he kept them from burning. If your focus is on what he's going to do to fix outside, you're not going to go in the fire. He doesn't need the economy to work to give you what you need. 
He doesn't need the DA to put me into a spacious place and fill my cup with oil. He doesn't need to move me over there for me to live my best life now. He is able to prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He can restore my soul in the valley of the shadow of death. My God knows exactly what my kids need and how to give it to them. My hope is not an environment or an economy or a place. It's in Jesus. The reason this is so important is because if you put your focus in something else, and that doesn't work, you'll collapse and you'll lose your faith. Now hope, in the English language, it's basically like, it's, it's kind of uncertainty. I hope we don't have load shedding today. But in big, biblical language, the, the word hope is a certain hope. It's not like a maybe this will happen. It's, it's a sense of certainty and it's wrapped together in faith. So faith is, faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things unseen. Faith is, is like the bigger part of hope. Hope is a portion of faith. Hope is the portion of faith that looks forward. But we know this, that by faith, we understand how the world was created by the word of God. So faith can look backwards at all the things that we've gone through and all the trial and pain and punishment, and we can look back and we can go, I know that God's actually working this for good, and if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have a better future. That's what faith does. Hope just looks forward. But they're completely interlinked. Biblical hope doesn't go, man, it would be cool if God does. Biblical hope goes, I am certain that God will. It is a faith-filled deal. And it's powerful. Now, biblical hope is not built on no substance. It's not built on just what I really would like to happen. The thing about biblical hope, because it's linked to faith, it has to be linked to the Word of God. So biblical hope is built on the promises of God. Now, here's where Rabbi's wrote. Just think about what you're hoping for this year. Just close your eyes. For a second, think about what you're hoping for. I'm hoping to win the lotto. <laughs> how many of those hopes, as you just rattle through them, <clears throat> how many of those hopes are linked to a scripture? Linked to a promise in the Bible? Linked to a sense that God called you into? You see, the Word of God gives you hope substance, and if you can't have the Word of God linked to your hope, you probably are hoping in something that is an English hope and not a Hebrew word hope. So the sons of Korah, probably with David, say, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I love this. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Let me tell you how you cultivate hope or how you get your hope back. First thought is, you remember. You remember. Remember when God touched your life. Remember when he spoke to you so crystal clearly. Remember when you got saved. Remember when he provided for you. When he gave you that thing. If, you, if you're new to Christ, speak to another Christian who's been around for a while because he can tell you all the remembrance. What David's doing or what the psalmist is doing is he's remembering all the moments he met with God. And your history with God is super, super important. You've got to remember it. He's remembering it. When you remember what God has done in you, what begins to happen is you go, man, I know I'm gloomy. I know I'm gray today and I'm seeing everything jadedly. But as I remember, I start to go, maybe he could do it again. That's what he's doing. He's remembering and he's starting to go, maybe he can do it again. If you want to cultivate hope, if you want to have a great quality of life and not die, remember. Just spend time remembering what God has done in your life. Remember Jesus on the cross. Hanging naked, whipped, rejected, mocked, humiliated for you. 
Remember that he says in his word that basically you are his inheritance. He did that for you. It was like so that he could get you, not just so that you could be saved, so that he could have you. He so utterly delights in you. Just remember that. Think, flip, he digs me ridiculously. Like in a codependent way, he wants me so much. Like he loves me unbelievably. Remember. First thing he says, if you want your, your hope back, remember. Second thing, if you want your hope back, Psalm 42 and 43 are really one song. He says, you are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Then he prays this, send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. You know what he's saying? He's going, I'm dark right now. I'm gloomy and depressed and I can't really see the light. I've been remembering, so I got like a glimpse but I need you to show me the way back into your presence. Because I know on Friday, I couldn't find it. I was properly gloomy. I was too sad. And some of you wake up day after day sad. And so David writes the psalm to go, pray this prayer. Pray that he give you light, just a little bit of light to get you back into the presence. Because in the presence, there is fullness of hope and joy. If you want, it, if you want your hope back, you've got to pray that prayer. And then last thing, if you want your hope back, you've got to praise him. He says, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Another thing about praise, we're gonna, the worship guys, you can come up. We're gonna end with praise. The thing about praise is it is, it is a, a warfare against your hopelessness. It is a declaration of his goodness in the midst of circumstances that don't really make sense. Praise is when the economy has taken so much from you, but you're still declaring, God, you've made a way before you are the way maker. You will make it again. What you're actually starting to do is you are fighting your soul that is pulling you down. And when you start to do that, you start to set yourself free from spiritual stuff that comes and jumps on you. And I want to say, say this to, to you. A lot of people allow demonic forces on them. The demonic forces are attracted to things like depressive thoughts and lies, like flies are to rotting meat. They come when you allow your brain to go in certain areas for too long. Now, again, please, if you're feeling like I'm bullying you and you're really sore, I'm not. I'm trying to equip you to get out. The way you break that is you start praising God for who he is despite what I'm feeling and what I'm going through. And in that process, you literally break stuff off your life. And many of you don't need another person to pray for you. You need a song to sing. It, it sets you free. It restores your mind. Let me read a last scripture. Worship guys, wherever they are, you can come. They will emerge out of the cave over there. In Romans 15, it says, May you overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. May you overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. As, you, as we go into worship now, just you. You're good, not that good. As you go into this, I'm praying that you begin to overflow with hope. I'm praying that that work of the Holy Spirit just explodes through you. But here's what you've got to know. Abraham, who 
who did some pretty amazing things. He, he managed to not concern himself, the Bible says, about the fact that Sarah was 90 plus, so well past childbearing age, and he needed the blue pill. He was, he was past there. And he didn't concern himself about this. He focused on the promise of God. A lot of your praise right now is going to redirect your concerns. Shift your concerns from what has been concerning you to concerning yourself about who God is in your circumstance. And as we do this, I don't know if it's all of us, but some of us are literally going to feel like sadness go and a river flow. So can we stand? We're going to sing together.
as you go today, may, may your words speak of God's goodness. And may, they, may your words literally be the fountain that fills you. And I pray, God, over people who are fighting chemical imbalance, I pray, Jesus, that you will put a dollop of faith that is so much more than they've ever experienced, that they'll start to sing a new song, that they'll say, your love, it washes over me like waves again and again and again, and you direct a song into my heart. And I pray, God, you will use this song to set them free in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. Lovely being with you. Have a great day.